I have the high honor of introducing our the first speaker, and actually he's a repeat, Professor Henning Schlein. Welcome back. Uh, he spoke at a previous uh, IEEE Baltimore chapter uh, seminar just a few months ago and gave us a great talk. A I'm sorry, ACM. <laughs> um, so Professor uh, Henning Schlein, Levy, professor of computer science at Columbia University, received his PhD from the University of Massachusetts in Amherst, Massachusetts. He was an MTS at AT&T Bell Laboratories and an associate department head at GM, GMD Focus in Berlin. Before joining, before joining the computer science and electrical engineering department at Columbia University. He served as the chair of the Department of Computer Science from 2004 to 2009 as engineering fellow, technology advisor, and chief technology officer at the US Federal Communications Commission from 2010 to 2017. In 2019 to 2020, he worked as a technology fellow at the US Senate. He is a fellow of the ACM and the IEEE, has received the New York City Mayor's Award for Excellence in Science and Technology, the VON Pioneer Award, the TCC Service Award, the IEEE Internet Award, the IEEE Region 1 William T Terry Award for Lifetime Distinguished Service to IEEE, the UMass Computer Science Outstanding Alumni Recognition, and is a member of the Internet Hall of Fame. Yep. Your next voice you'll hear will be Professor Henning. Thank you. Let me share my book. Um, should I share my screen? Yes. Yes. Please share your screen, and you can you can begin your talk when you're ready. I'm ready. Okay. Good morning, everyone. I'm sorry I uh, can't be there in person. It's a bit of a uh, drive for me to get there. Uh, so today I want to, as we were just uh, talking about stimulate some discussion. So my measure of success will be not how much you agree with what I say, but how much you mentally at least say, but, but. I uh, And so hopefully we'll get into that discussion a little bit, uh, maybe doing the breakout sessions, maybe uh, offline uh, in that. Because I think we are at an inflection point in the discussion of next generation networks. We have now a pretty good sense of how 5G turned out uh, in a sense that it's widely deployed, at least in many countries, uh, it's actually used, but we've also seen that some of the predictions that we've had about 5G turned out to be somewhat off the mark. Right? Not that it wasn't useful, like I said, it's become kind of a daily technology. It's no longer part of you know, the advertising hype as much, but it is uh, turned out to be different than what I think maybe the earlier 5G summits uh, in 2015 might have predicted if you were to go back and look at what people said at that time. So when we talk about 5G, 6G, and this is true for the Wi-Fi side as well. I'll be focusing mostly on uh, the non-Wi-Fi side today uh, in that, is that we have these classical IMT type of requirements diagrams here. And like we have for 5G, we had extreme mobile broadband, ultra reliable low latency, and so on. And while there aren't any official IMT requirements for 6G or next G in general. Uh, the easy one is just like you do the 10 year uh, notion, every generation you just divide or multiply depending on uh, the characteristic, uh, the, the previous performance KPIs and by 10, and that gets you your uh, next generation requirements. That to some extent, particularly for people working at the physical layer can be quite helpful, but I think it's increasingly irrelevant. 
uh, simply because most applications are not limited by speed. The number of very low latency applications has turned out to be pretty limited. Uh, and we are now able to support very high densities of devices already uh, that probably are sufficient for most applications. So it is not obvious that simply multiplying or dividing the previous generation requirements by 10 is going to give us meaningful guidance. I'll leave aside that generally speaking, most of these requirements that were posited for 4G and 5G and 3G actually were never met. They tended to be met one generation late, but that's a separate discussion. So I believe that if we do these requirements, the most important requirement is missing, and I'll get to that. Uh, here, I'm showing something which has nothing whatsoever to do with cellular, namely, I'm simply showing uh, the data usage for a one of uh, the largest cable provider in the United States, Comcast, and I show the median data usage uh, that they have experienced. Uh, and in the inset, I show uh, the effective cost, uh, as the Bureau of Labor Statistics publishes it uh, for that. Uh, so what we've seen is until very recently, and there's some interesting stuff happening at the right side of the curve that I won't, won't belabor today, is that we've had roughly a 35% annual growth rate of the amount of gigabytes per month that uh, the median, that's not the mean, but mean is a bit higher, uh, has been using and not. So the average usage of a household in the United States is roughly speaking right now about 500 gigabytes per month, the average. So the median is somewhere in the 350s uh, in that. And if you take kind of a typical cost for such a home broadband connection, the effective per gigabyte cost is about 12 cents per gigabyte. Uh, in that. That's kind of if you just divide the two by um, in that. So the most important characteristics in my mind is not whether the latency is divided or the top speed is multiplied, but whether it can support the ever increasing use of broadband data, uh, both in mobile and residential circumstances. And importantly, can do that cost effectively. And indeed, I think the most important statistic uh, for the improvement in uh, 3G, 4G, and 5G uh, type of systems really shown here on this graph, namely the cost, or more in this case, it's the revenue per gigabyte. Now, from a carrier perspective, that's probably a statistic that you'd rather not see um, because the number has been going down. But from a consumer perspective, the only way to enable new applications is to make those applications financially viable. And indeed, if you talk about some of the applications that are routinely mentioned for 4G and 5G, it is not so much that they peak data rate would say exceed what 5G or 4G even can provide, certainly not what Wi-Fi can provide, but it is the data volume that you're looking at. So I've just picked randomly kind of a prototypical virtual reality gaming application, the Google Stadia uh, one, uh, and it consumes 20 gigabytes per hour of gaming. So given that many people play multiple hours of games a night, I, so you can easily imagine that not doing anything else, not watching videos, not doing any other internet related things, you're into the hundreds of gigabytes per month. There's just no way currently that you can support that on uh, cellular networks. So what I believe is that the key performance metric for next generation networks, particular uh, carrier style networks where you know, the user pays directly is dollars or you know, your favorite local currency per gigabyte uh, in that. And somewhat separately and for different applications, primarily IoT applications, dollars per square kilometer of coverage, namely how much money does it cost to just provide basic non-volume constrained coverage for 
uh, low bandwidth IoT applications as you might find them in agriculture or uh, other infrastructure type applications. So as a caveat, uh, it is interesting to note that the amount of revenue uh, per user and the amount of data usage actually varies quite widely, even for countries that are otherwise similar in terms of, say, income uh, in that. A separate discussion, I just point that out as a caveat because I'll be using averages. So, and those can be somewhat misleading given the wide variation. The key number, however, that I want to show to you today is if you take those numbers in terms of the average US revenue per user in 2022 is about $35. And if you take the average mobile traffic that supported by cellular network in uh, that area, namely the 14.6 gigabytes uh, that are listed on this particular chart, you end up with a number of $2.40 effective costs per gigabyte. There are different ways of computing it. They all end up roughly in that number. The interesting part is not whether it's a little more or a little less is that it is roughly 20 times at the moment more expensive per gigabyte than home Wi-Fi is. Meaning that unless next generation networks on the, of the carrier style support a dramatic reduction in bandwidth cost that is competitive with home networks, there will always be an incentive to provide these high bandwidth applications such as VR, type applications such as gaming, uh, such as industrial applications, not via cellular applications or mobile applications, but via boring Wi-Fi, whatever generation, Wi-Fi 6, 7, whatever, um, and using just your home fiber connection or home uh, HFC connection. Uh, in, uh, simply because there's just this order of magnitude plus difference in cost. And indeed, this is not new. Uh, this discrepancy, if you go back historically, I've done a little bit of back of the embryo calculations along those lines, has roughly been at least a factor 10 uh, if you go back uh, even the previous generation in that, that just getting bandwidth at home is just so much less expensive. Uh, I'll make an analogy. This is very much similar to what the discussion is in the electric vehicle market, where uh, I, my the real uh, economic efficiencies, if you don't like to pay $5 for a gallon for gas, is to charge at home, not at a fast charger in that. And so there's this kind of analogy that home is cheaper, just like it's for, for many other things. I want to focus, however, on a slightly different aspect, namely that I believe that besides aiming for cost reduction, one of the most important things to look at uh, as we look at next generation network is what is our overall network architecture and what is our span of network architectures that we can support. Uh, and this has been pretty boring uh, for the first really five generations of the network with a few dents on in the fifth one, uh, is we had a unquestioned assumption that the telephone company model of a vertically integrated carrier was really the only way to offer services as in a single company, maybe through some subcontractors, but essentially integrated, would own anything from the fiber in the ground to the tower popping off the ground to the network operation center and even applications, classical being voice and, and text, uh, to authentication, to billing. Everything was at least managed by uh, and integrated by a single entity in each region, country, whatever it happens to be. And then we're seeing, I don't recall that this was really even subject to a large amount of discussion. Uh, in, uh, in particular, that meant that network elements such as kind of the early 3G uh, example I put up here is were largely mutually trusting and assumed to be operating, uh, operated by the same entity, uh, same administrative entity in that, um, even if they were provided by say two different vendors. 
the latter was uncommon, but that was at least if you build to standards possible, but there was never the assumption that you would just integrate different uh, providers into one system. But we're now at a point, particularly for next generation network, where that model is fraying. We're now seeing, for example, uh, that most of the towers for macro cells in particular, but also otherwise, are now no longer owned by the carrier. They're typically shared infrastructure by a number of large tower companies in that that own most of the towers and then lease them out. Um, and we see that clearly uh, things such as devices that used to be at least branded and largely designed by carriers are now largely independent of carriers. Applications have, uh, the carriers have essentially abandoned applications. They can't even get voice right anymore. Uh, and so, and we have external entities like spectrum databases for CBRS. So we see the beginnings, but might maybe leave one piece at a time of having networks which are much more disaggregated, where the user experience is assembled, if invisible in some cases, from a number of vendors. One of the big challenges related to that is that 5G in particular uh, has had the financial challenges, and this has been true in my countries as diverse as China and the United States, that the return on investment for uh, these type of network has not been spectacular, simply because but users have not been willing to pay a premium for 5G connectivity. It's pretty much the same thing uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, and uh, and uh, the carriers have tried to reduce the capital intensity of the network so that from a historical average, about 15%, uh, that was kind of a constant for many years in countries, we've now actually dropped somewhat below that into a 12% range. So one of the big questions is going to be who and why are you going to pay for next generation networks when you've just paid for, relatively speaking, just for uh, 5G networks and that, given that it is unlikely that users will pay more for the same service. Um, indeed, like I said, they're likely want to pay less at least on a gigabyte level. I want to focus on one aspect, and there's a few others, but this is sort of say the most visible one of the network that we all see all the time that quote decorate the landscape. Because we have this tremendous number now of about a million or so cell sites, um, about 450,000 macro towers a few years ago. In that. And generally speaking, as I said, the carriers don't own those. Uh, they're leased by various entities, and they generate a significant amount of revenue. So according to the cell leasing side, that's about $71,000 for a macro tower site uh, in that. I put across all the carriers hosted there in that. And on the receivings and sort of say, if you happen to have a plot and you don't care about the opinion of your neighbors, I then, I, or a piece with your neighbors, you can le lease this to a cell site uh, operator for between $500 and $1,500 a month uh, in that. So you can decide whether you want to be hated more by hosting an Airbnb or a cell site. So I'm not giving you advice here, but maybe in some cases for commercial operators, this is a, come on, this is how they make money. And this is how many landlords in urban area, for example, get paid uh, in that. So this, these costs that are listing here don't include the radio equipment and fiber backhaul and all that. That's just purely uh, attaching something to a tower or leasing space on a rooftop. Uh, in that. So this is a large part of the expense of operating a network is real estate. Now, what's happening is, again, in this kind of shakeup of traditional models is that you have new operator models. 
Uh, the cable industry in particular has been experimenting with that quite successfully, uh, in that, namely that they're using their own Wi-Fi infrastructure to carry some of the traffic, and they've garnered a significant number of customers uh, in this MVNO Plus model that Comcast has several million, for example. What's been emerging is that you have a new kinds of networks which are bottom up as opposed to top down. So I'll give two examples of that. The Things Network and Helium, both of those provide uh, long range wireless for uh, low bitrate application, uh, LoRa for um, IoT application, where you build or you set up a base station and then connect it to the network such as one shown here. Uh, so at Columbia, uh, these are some of my students uh, setting up a um, things network site that covers pretty much now um, our upper part of Manhattan. LoRa has been doing this in a more fashionable way using uh, blockchain type of technologies where you get paid in the same way as um, on a much smaller scale as the cell tower operators I mentioned uh, in that uh, and you can basically invest in an access point and get paid for that. Um, this deserves a longer discussion given the collapse in crypto asset prices um, and it, the, whether this business model is viable, but it illustrates a different model in that. Um, and you can see there's plenty of these covering Manhattan, for example. Uh, but again, this runs into the problem that traditional network, 4G or 5G, assume I have a large operator that is in the 5G case for uh, the new network architecture, uh, is able to operate a fully cloud operated system. You're not going to operate that for a small business or your own network that you want to offer. You're not going to set up a full cloud system, let us say an APC type of model in the old world with all its components, because most of those are completely irrelevant to your use case. What we've seen also is that the uh, internet actually has had a fairly constant ratio of users per, per edge, roughly according to my calculation, about 60K users. So even though the number of users on the right and the number of ASN has been linearly increasing, uh, the slope has been roughly similar so that the number of users per network has not changed all that much. What has changed is that the number of network devices that are invisible, namely that we now have really small enterprise networks at home that even though we haven't done anything about it are largely self-managing, not always well, but reasonably well all the way from mesh networks to some form of user and device authentication. Thus, I believe that one of the notions combining the idea that we're going to see new models for providing network services that are bottom up as opposed to top down, that are distributed versus centralized, that we need to design next generation networks to scale up from very small uh, networks to very large ones, and in particular, more importantly, because that's new, scale down from nationwide networks designed for millions of users and a professional management system to something which can be run in a box at home by one user without much intervention in there and can support either a private network or a part, be, become part of a public network infrastructure. So um, we will not have time to go into it in great detail. So I believe beyond the cost model, we should look at a number of functions or properties that define what I think is a good network. Namely, is it universal? Can I operate my system anywhere? Uh, is the incremental system cost low? Is the data cost low so that I can offer free services as part of say, a university or a business? Uh, can I build my own network? Can I do my own user management if that's what I want for a corporate and a campus type environment? Very difficult to do that now as a settler one. I have to might be, do MVNO type of stuff, which is extremely high overhead. And can the system manage itself? So 
Ashutosh mentioned kind of that we, we have these two parallel threads uh, going on in next generation networks, and maybe IEEE 8211 and but, uh, IMT type of cellular networks and that. And I believe that if we look at primarily 6G networks, the Wi-Fi actually architecturally, even though I don't think that was part of a design, just necessity, has offered um, lessons in architectural flexibility the ability to support a wide range of authentication models, a very low entry point, as in the smallest and simplest Wi-Fi network is achievable with a cell phone or with a local access point that you can run. Actually, now you can run access points on light bulbs um, that you do. And it has had international usability from the very beginning. But we may not want to maintain two of these networks because that combination has not been integrated well from a user perspective. Uh, typing in usernames and passwords, like Ashutosh mentioned for the venue, is not a good user experience. We should be able to do better than that. And so what I think we should look at, even though that has not received a whole lot of attention for next generation networks, is how do we create better authentication models that support a wide variety of a low cost and maybe low security, where I don't really care if somebody uses my network, uh, to my international roaming type of scenarios. And indeed, minimizing the overall complexity, particularly at the control plane level, I think will be paramount in making 6G something more than 5G++. So what are some of the requirements? Um, is in particular, some of the interfaces must be separable, or every interface must be separable and testable. Uh, Interfaces should not assume that they're operated by the same entity on both sides. They should not require trust. So kind of a zero trust networking model. And clearly this needs to be all auto configured without any manual configuration uh, that goes along with that. Um, there's a few other things that go along with that. I'm, I'm a little bit short on time here, but I, we need better frequency coordination for some of these new frequency sharing models, particularly in CBRS. Uh, they support the inter-class uh, ones pretty well. They don't support uh, the intra-class uh, sharing all that well, surprisingly. Uh, we need self-contained access network infrastructure, EPC and equivalent elsewhere, uh, much more simplified roaming, um, whether that involves blockchains or not, but I think uh, the GSMA model of becoming a member of that is unlikely to scale organizationally, not technically, and maybe we need simplified mobility models since most of the new applications aren't really mobile, they're more nomadic than mobile. I'll skip that. Um, so I think we have two evolutionary paths for next gen in general, namely continuation basically of our current model where Wi-Fi and next generation 6G type cellular models largely proceed in parallel uh, with very little integration versus a notion that we have a network that scales down all the way to an individual access point. Let me conclude the key performance metric that we need for new networks is not the performance metrics of 4G and 5G scaled, but is primarily about cost of deployment and cost of operation. How do we incentivize investment, possibly by integrating non-traditional providers such as home users and leveraging their fiber access infrastructure? We need to rethink the architecture, not just uh, focus on PHY, as important as that is. And I think about how we can disaggregate the network and in the internet spirit, which has always had this notion that you can take different parts of the network stack, DNS, uh, media servers, uh, authentication, and assemble those Lego-like into a, a overall, you don't have to buy the whole package, so to say. And that means that the control plane in particular needs to be simplified and made available across providers. Uh, so there are plenty of opportunities that go beyond my 
the important phi-level designs or new spectrum bands like terahertz in fundamentally rethinking what a next generation network will look like and making it available to a much larger set of actors than the traditional providers that we've grown used to and that will certainly play a role, but maybe not a leading role in that next generation network. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Schilzelein. Uh, for that great talk. Uh, we have time for a couple of questions. Um, and if there are any questions from the room or if there are any questions online, you can post them in the chat. Do we have a question? So I, I have one question. Um, so you talked about the uh, the uh, requirements that are going to be driving the next G. Um, which which vertical or which um, do you, is there a particular area or a particular vertical, um, either either the commercial sector or the um, the health sector, financial sector? Do you see a specific sector driving that, or you see it's going to be across the board? Uh, yeah, I think that, uh, the notion of predicting applications. I, I certainly don't feel qualified to do that. It is pretty clear in the market. Like I said, there's some indications that that may be flattening. Uh, that it's really been a combination, if you look at the increased usage, particularly at the residential level, uh, that, and, and when almost all data is residential these days, I mean, I'm, I'm consumer as opposed to industrial. Uh, that, that's really been a combination of probably three applications, some of which weren't really predictable going forward. Namely, one uh, was the emergence of things like what we're doing today, uh, that we spend hours each day, whether in the office or not, on uh, various video applications. Uh, the second one, video entertainment, with displacement and replacement of traditional video distribution by uh, various streaming providers. And thirdly, uh, online gaming, of a storage that looks essentially like video streaming as well. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, my only prediction shuttle so side is that we're going to have two requirements uh, that are uh, relatively easy to say without worrying about where the data is coming from. We'll need more data per user. Uh, we can quibble about the growth rates, but uh, it's unlikely that will continue. Um, and secondly, we will make, make, need to make sure that low bandwidth connectivity uh, that does not ha have to be gigabit per second, uh, but maybe even me measured in kilobits per second, is available pretty much everywhere, including in places that are uh, largely free of I mean, human occupation, so to say, including, let's say, the oceans, including uh, remote areas, simply because that enables new applications that are individually not all that valuable, but combined just uh, interesting for safe public safety, um, and, as well as just environmental monitoring and uh, autonomous vehicles or vehicle safety more generally, and so on. And so I wouldn't focus too much on is there like a, is it VR, is it AR, is it telehealth in that? The whole beauty of the internet model has been that we don't have to be right on the application because we provide an infrastructure, not an application into a vertically integrated system. I'm not. Got it. Thank you very much. So a number um, of other questions. I don't know how many I can. Yeah, so what, we, what we'd like to do if it's, if it's possible, Professor Shizaline is, um, there are a number of questions online, but uh, in in the sake of for the sake of time, if you wouldn't mind, um, you want to do one more? Okay, we'll do one. We'll do one from online, and then um, there's a number of other questions. If you could maybe address them in the chat, but I'll pick one more from the chat to read out loud, and then maybe yep. you could address the others um, uh, as a part of the chat. Okay. So uh, the the second one is asked about. Um, related to wired networks. And you talked about um, wireless networks, but what about the scalability of wired networks? That's a good question. Uh, namely, uh, and this deserves another 
talk that I am I am happy to point you to that I've made is that there is a parallel discussion uh, going on about this wired networks, and indeed you could argue that one of the reasons that there's such an interest in um, fiber networks these days, particularly in the US, but also in many European countries in that is that the, the extreme simplified network architecture of passive optical networks where you have no active elements really between for the last few miles really and distances somewhat similar to um, the wireless distances, at least macro cell distances and beyond, uh, that that has enabled much more cost effective deployment, but that many of the challenges of scaling down these uh, networks still exist even on uh, the, uh, the, um, the wired network side. And uh, there has been this large emphasis from moving and there's a number of companies that have made it quite successful uh, in that as in they, they've become visible because of that simply because they now offer systems that can be deployed say by a small rural electric cooperative that used to just sell electricity to a few thousand people they can now offer that uh, also services via say pawn type of systems in that so the ESV is an interesting parallel that actually deserves exploration um, as well Sure, thank you. So with that, we will um, we'll, uh, close the questions uh, for in-person. There are a number of questions in the chat. And so if you would, if you would, could address them, I, I think there, uh, there could be a good discussion going on in chat, All right? We also um, have a token of our appreciation for your talk, uh, and we will be sending this to you um, uh, via, via snail mail. Um, so at, at this point, thank you very much.